God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus Christ, we come, Lord, we bless you, we praise you, we magnify you, Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to show our love toward you, for you certainly love us. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come before you in Bible study to study your word. We pray, Father God, that your word will fall on good soil, that your word, Father God, will meet people where they are, and that your word will become real to those who listen and hear. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. God we serve truly love us. The question is, do we love him? Yes. Amen. Yes. The question becomes, do we do we love him? Amen. He loves us. We have to love him. We ought to love him. Amen. Because he loves us. We're in chapter 3 tonight. Chapter 3 is where we are tonight. We're in chapter 3. Everybody's prepared for chapter 3. Amen? Amen. Chapter 3 is dealing with personalized. Yes. There are five P's to effective evangelism. Yes, How many P's? Five. How many P's? Five. five P's. And they are? Oh, y'all missed it again. Good <laughs> God. <laughs> y'all got to look at this stuff before you show up on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. There are five P's, five P's. There are five P's to effective evangelism. There are how many P's? There are five P's to effective evangelism. We're on number three tonight. What are those five P's? Be prayer, pinpoint, personalize, and pride. Boy, y'all tore that one up too. Let's try it one more again. There are five P's to effective evangelism. Amen? Amen. They are? Oh, you got it that time. About the 18th time you got it. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord for, for the five P's to effective evangelism. As we look at the five P's to effective evangelism, we're re reminded that prepare is the most important one. Yes? yes? Prepare is the most important one. Why is prepare the most important one? Foundation. Foundation? Anybody else? You got to be prepared for what you're going to teach or tell somebody. Anybody else? Why is preparation so important? So if we're going to witness or be winners of souls, we must spend a great percentage of our time in prepare. What is that? What percentage of time should we spend in preparation? 90% of our time ought to be spent in preparation and 10% of our time ought to be spent actually sharing the gospel good news. Amen? Because if we're not prepared, we won't share it properly. We won't share it the way God would have us to share it. Amen? So the five P's to effective evangelism, out of all those five, prepare is the most important one. Amen. Also, we understand that the greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. Amen? That you have been healed from HIV. That's great. Hallelujah. God is the one that did it. We ought to give him praise. You've been healed from diabetes. Praise the Lord. You've been healed from cancer. Praise the Lord. You've been healed from bitterness. Praise the Lord. But the good news today is the greatest, the greatest miracle that you will ever or anybody will ever, ever, ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. Amen. Because the saving of the soul guarantees us health and wealth here, as well as health and wealth there. Now, when you say wealth, I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about non-tangible things. God gives us every single day. Mercy and grace, God gives us every single day of our life. He gives us mercy because we don't deserve it. He gives us grace because we don't deserve it. Mercy means he overlooks or Jesus' blood covers a multitude of our sins. The love of Jesus Christ has covered us. 
While we were yet sinners, Paul said, Jesus died for us. While we were yet sinners, God demonstrated, God commended, God made sure that we understood his love for us. And he did it by showing Jesus Christ death on the cross. He died for us. I know sometimes your children get to a point where you want, wish uh, you would push them off to the side for a little while, but you wouldn't give any one of your bad children to die for anybody else. Amen? But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. In prepare, there's an intern there. The intern is a soul winner. The intern is a soul winner. The soul winner tells and, and prepare, the soul winner tells the patient. Who's the patient? The, the one who is to be saved. The soul winner tells the patient what God, who God is, what he can do, what he will do, what he has done. In other words, the intern always brags on God. The focus is always on Jesus Christ and your soul winning experience. Your testimony is a great thing. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight when we talk about personal life. Your testimony is excellent. Your testimony is a great thing. But God, Jesus' story, the God story that Jesus gave his son is the greatest testimony of them all. Amen. God's story of how he gave his son. In pinpoint, the soul winner is a different person. The soul winner is it has a different career. What is that soul winner doing? Who 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 we recognize? What 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 occupation do we recognize as soul winner in pinpoint? Yes, ma'am. Anybody? He's a paramedic. The paramedic takes vital signs, transport the patient to the doctor. He's not the doctor. He will never be the doctor. Guess what? He's just a paramedic. He's taking the vital signs. He's looking at the blood pressure. He's looking at the temperature. And he's transporting the patient to the doctor. And the doctor is Jesus. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. The righteous son of God. The conquering king of Calvary. His name is Jesus Christ. The righteous one. Amen? Amen. So we move today to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is personalized. And when we deal with personalized, we guess what? Take a guess at what we're doing. We're getting personal. Mm -hmm. We're meeting a person where he or she is. Yeah. We are dealing with our personal lives in order to better someone else's life. Personalized, personalized. Personalized, personalized. We got it, sister. Personalized, right? Mean, means that, that you are going to be personally involved with somebody. You're going to have to let them into your world. They're going to have to accept you in their world. Because you're leading people to Christ. Chapter 3, the soul winner's consultation must be made real. The soul winner is evaluating here. The soul winner is a nurse. The soul winner's consultation must be made real to the patient's heart condition. Sister Brown told us last time we gathered that, that, that Melissa had a heart problem. And if she didn't get to the doctor, she would die. The doctor is Jesus. Sister Brown also told us that in order to successfully lead people to Christ, you must look at every patient, every unbeliever, every unsaved person as your personal child. You must consider them your children because with your children, you have a fool to get, get them help. Driving on the left side of the road, got double flashes going, police pulls you over, you say, don't give me my ticket, I got to get my baby to the doctor. You will do things out of the ordinary. People who've never driven before start driving cars to get their baby to the doctor. So every single person who's not saved, who needs Jesus, you must look at that person as somebody that's near and dear to you, and in this case, it's your own child. Anybody in their right mind, we are wonderful these days that are not in their right mind. 
I mean, they may they may plead uh, medical issues, but they just they just not in their right mind. But any person in their right mind wants the best for their children. And what I'm saying to you is, any unsaved person, you need to want the best for them. The soul winner must be willing to make things real to the patient's heart condition. We all had a heart condition. We all have heart conditions. The soul winner is the nurse who prepares the patient in the atmosphere for an appointment with the great physician. His name is Jesus. I told you about Dr. William. Dr. William is still practicing 30 years later, and he's still a young man. I would call him young because he's in his 60s. So Dr. Williams was, is a world-class, great doctor. And when I showed up, the little girl named Sam used to show up bouncing on her toes. She would ask the question, you came to see the, the good doctor, right? Yes, I did. It didn't matter with me how many, how many good conversations I could have with Sam. I didn't come to see Sam. I came to see the doctor. And it didn't matter what Sam said to me. The bottom line, at the end of the day, whatever Sam said, I'm still looking through what she's saying. I'm looking for the doctor. Yeah. What I'm saying to you, the soul winner is the nurse who prepares the patient in the atmosphere for an appointment with the great physician. The only thing Sam did was, was come in and welcome me and take me to a room, take my blood pressure, talk to me a little while, and the whole time she's talking to me, I'm wondering where's the doctor. And a few times I went to the doctor, and there was the doctor wasn't there, but there was somebody else there substituting for the doctor. I left there dissatisfied because I came to see the doctor. The soul winner must lead people to see the doctor. Jesus. Only Jesus can fix a soul. Only Jesus can fix the mind of a man. When you look at Mark chapter 5, you see in Mark chapter 5, there's a man running crazy in the graveyard. Verses 1 through 20 paints the picture very clearly. The Bible says in verses 1 through 5 that this man had his dwelling, meaning he lived in the graveyard. He was living in the graveyard. Raise your hand if you want to stop living where you're living and live in the graveyard. He had graveyard mentality. He had a messed up mind. He had graveyard mentality. Sometimes I look at people walking down the street and I say, ooh, that's graveyard mentality. Because they're living among the dead. This man in Mark chapter 5 was living among the dead. The Bible says he was in the graveyard day and night. The Bible says in verses 1 through 5 that when the people tried to shackle him, handcuff him, and chain him, he was so strong he broke the chain. It says no man could tame him. No man could hold him. No man could bind him. But then when you get to verse number 6 in Mark chapter 5, it says that when Jesus showed up, he ran to Jesus and bowed down and worshipped him. Whoo! Hallelujah to the Lamb. He bowed down and worshipped him. And as you continue to read that for Rick Pete, it shows you the fact that even the demons understood who Jesus was. What we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the great God, what do we have to do with you? Jesus, why are you messing with us? And Jesus gave him permission to leave and go into the swine. Only Jesus can regulate the mind. The folk back home would say it like this. He's a mind regulator and he's a heart fixer. His name is Jesus. The soul winner must prepare the atmosphere for the patient to see the great physician. The great physician name is Jesus. The soul winner is the nurse who prepares the patient. He, she prepares the paperwork. She prepares the vital sign. She reviews the patient admission paperwork. <laughs> so what is the bad atmosphere for the doctor? I went to Dr. Weed one time and, and my, my rotor cuff was messed up. My knees were hurting. My back was hurting. 
And he walked in and he said, boy, you falling apart. He said, man, you falling apart, man. You falling apart. But the moment the doctor showed up in the white coat, mm -hmm. I began to feel just a little bit better. Mm -hmm. right. It may have been a psychological thing for me, but the fact of the matter is, I knew that there was help in the room because the doctor was in the house. There's help in the room. The season saints sing that song, come on in the room. Come on in the room. And when they sung that song, they were telling Jesus, I know you're already here, but make your presence known. Do some stuff, Jesus. Heal. Do some stuff. Make me feel better. So when the doctor shows up, you ought to feel just a little bit better. Before he even takes a stethoscope from around his neck, I felt a little better. Just to know that Jesus is on your side, just to know you're on Jesus' team, just to know that Jesus is present with us ought to make us feel just a little bit better. Regardless of what we go through, we know that Jesus makes us better. The nurse assessed all of the subjective and objective information. The nurse is responsible. The nurse is responsible for gathering data on the patient's previous pain relief and treatments, methods, and the disorders, and the over-the-counter medication. That's why when the nurse comes in, she asks you, what meds are you on? Then she asks you, how long has been going on? How long you been hurt? And usually my answer is like six months. Why is that my answer? So, Brown, why is that my answer? Like six months. Putting off seeing the doctor. And let me tell you, when you put off seeing the doctor, it only gets worse. When you get to a point where you don't want to hear from Jesus, you don't want to see Jesus, when you don't want to hear what Jesus has to say, your matter is going to get worse. And as it gets worse, you're going to fall apart. How long has it been happening? Oh, about three months, six months, somewhere in there. And let me tell you this. Sometimes you can get involved with the same thing so long and let the same thing agonize you so long, you forget when it started. You just plainly forget when it started. You just been hopping. I was hopping around on that knee for so long until I just forgot when it started. But when, you, when the doctor shows up, the next thing you have to do is be honest with the doctor. Be honest with the doctor. The nurse going to take your medication and write them all down and your aspirins and, and your, your vitamins. She's going to write all these things down, but you got to be honest. If you got a disorder, and a lot of us got, all of us got some kind of disorder, the nurse needs to know so the doctor can hear from it. The nurse advises a patient on preventing, preventing this, uh, preventive services, health screening, and present medication regimens. The nurse is just an advisor. The nurse tells the patient, now, we've seen this thing before. When you got somebody that's unsaved, you've seen this character before. You, you've seen how they act. You've seen how, how sin tears their lives apart. How many of you ever have gone to your class reunions? Your high school class reunions? Just one time. I guess the first one is 10 years. Is that correct? Five years? Boy, y'all are excited about each other here in Texas. Our first one was 10 years. Okay? And when you go to your first class reunion, do you ever leave there saying, Wow. Why you leave that saying wow? Hmm. But when I why you leave that saying wow? I believe that's it. This you is didn't the go? Same person. Hmm? Can't believe it's the same person. Can't believe it's the same person. Why you can't believe it's the same person? Because it's been five years. Because it's been five years. You can't believe they're the same person because it's been five years. You didn't think they're gonna make five years? They've they, they gone through a lot of changes, right? 
then some of us are up to 40 years. I'm almost in my 45th year. A whole heap of things have changed. And then there are some things that have remained the same. There are some attitudes that still like we still in high school. There are some frustrations that people had in high school. They still have no frustrations. And then there are some people who choose not to come by whatever means or whatever reason they choose not to come. But at the end of the day, you leave them saying, wow. Wow. Wow, things have not changed since high school. Wow, things have taken a drastic change since high school. Wow. It's because of the way we live our lives, right? It's because of what we do with our body. It's because of the way we treat our temple, the, the, the God temple that God has given us. Also, the nurse is responsible for providing information on the latest and best procedures for, for long-lasting results. Because they do surveys all the time, they do research all the time, and many times you will hear the nurse or the doctor say, the research has said. The research has determined this. The research has said this. At the end of the day, the research will not lie because people, even though they're human, they are using valid research. And so the nurse said, hey, now, I'm just going to tell you now, the doctor is not going to go for this. Because I know the doctor. That's why the psalmist says that Moses knew the ways of God. And the people were only concerned about the mighty acts of God. Are you with me? So in other words, Moses, the leader, needs to always know how God will react in certain situations. And the only way for you to find that out is by spending quality time with God. That's why preparation is so important. And when you're in preparation, you are preparing by reading, you're preparing by studying, you're preparing by praying, you're preparing by meditating. Spending quality time with God. Most of the time, we suffer because we don't spend quality time with God. And check this out. Prayer is free. Am I serving notice on anybody? Prayer is free. There's no cover charge to prayer. There's no money attached to prayer. You don't have to give up any of your savings to pray. Preparation is important. The nurse, the nurse. Who is the nurse? The soul winner is the nurse, right? The, mer the, the nurse must display soft skills at all times. What does that mean? Some of you medical folk. Soft skills. It means the clinical and the clin clinician provides active listening, compassion, integrity, diligence. We must Meet people where we are. I told you, personalized deals with us meeting people and people meeting us. Us getting to know folk and the folk getting to know us. So the clinician, the, 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 the nurse, the, the person that's setting the atmosphere, setting the environment, we must ensure the patient of confidentiality. Conversations that we have are just confidential. Conversations that we have must be conversations that benefits the patient in order to get the patient to the doctor. Isn't that something? We must demonstrate that we are there for the patient. We are there for the person who's unsaved. We want to win their souls for Christ. And I told you already, we don't, draw, we don't draw people to Christ. We just do the witnessing and the Holy Spirit draws them. So we must be good listeners. We must show compassion. You're going to hell. Is that compassion? 
does that draw a person near, nearer to Christ? That sin you in, you better get out of it. Is that going to help us get anywhere? We must be patient with people like God was patient with us. You had to hear the word of God several times before you came in going. And God had a way of dealing with you where we relate to Romans 8 and 28. All this stuff you've gone through is going to work together for the good. God has a way of making sure that everything you've gone through, everything that, that you think has been messed up, will work out for the good. God has a way of blessing us. And he blesses us in spite of us. And therefore, we must be compassionate and have, have um, pity and make sure the atmosphere is tranquil and, and peaceful, relaxing for a person. The soul winner must create an atmosphere in which the patient understands that he or she is not alone. You are there with them. One of the biggest fears that I heard during the COVID, the COVID uprising was, I don't want to die alone. You ever heard that? It's almost like a person said, I know I'm going to die. But I have the fear of dying alone. I don't want to die alone. Is that important to you? Somebody said, what do you, th what do you think, Brother Brown? It's not necessarily to me. I'm going to die. I'm just going to die. <laughs> <laughs> after you really think about it, after you really, really think about it, when a person is dead, they go on to the next story. Next chapter, next page, next book. Now they may have sorrow during their last moments that I have nobody to be here with me. But if you really, really think about it, does it really matter? But people don't want to die alone. So since people don't want to die alone, then we as soul winners must set the atmosphere that you're not alone. I'm with you, and God is with you. And one way of doing that is to let that person know that I'm a sinner too. Romans 3 and 23 says that we all have sinned. We all have fallen short. We all have messed up. We all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Sin is common to all of us. Don't think your sin is better because your sin is different. You just got a different sin. Some of the biggest sinners are the ones that show up every time. And they don't, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't party. They're not caught into drugs and alcohol. They're not caught into pornography. They're not caught into to prostitution. They're not homosexuals. They're not lesbians. But guess what? They got some funky attitudes. Church folk got some of the worst attitude you could ever find on planet Earth and Pluto. Amen. Church folk. Mm -hmm. I mean, they show up with this thing about them. I know they don't do that at your church, and I know they don't do that at, at New Beginning, but some folks sh show up at church with a chip on their shoulder. I, I better not have anybody approach me about anything today. I'm going to let them really have it. Mm -hmm. And when you see them coming, Move over, give them 600 feet. Because they're on a mission. <laughs> they're on a mission to destroy your day. Sometimes they'll even get upset if you say good morning. What's good about it? It's in the church. Sin. Sin has crept up in the church. But let me serve notice on you. Sin will not creep in heaven. Sin will not have a place, a seat, or a place to stand in heaven. God cannot even be in the presence of sin. Well, preacher, 
I come to church. You ask me to come to church, I come to church. You ask me to give tithes, I give tithes. You ask me to sit, sit down and be quiet until I'm spoken to. I sit down and be quiet until so I'm spoken to. Yeah, but your attitude. Ooh, smell like chillness. Unwashed, unclean chickens. Nasty attitude. And, it's the, and, and, and Peter says it like this. When we are washed from sin and choose to go back and lick upon it again, Peter says it's like a, a hog wallowing in the mud and somebody coming and cleaning them off and waxing them up and drying them off and he run right back to the mud. I'm telling you, I, I have a whole degree in hogology. The moment you feed him, the moment you clean him, he's going right back to the mud. Peter says, when you clean from sin, you become nothing but a dog or a hog that goes back and wallow in the mud again if you don't walk away from sin. And then he says, as a dog, what the dog would do, he will eat up food and then he will vomit it up and then eat it up again. You think that's nasty? That's what God describes sin as. Eating up vomit. Go back and do it again. Lord, you forgave me last time. I know you're going to forgive me this time. <laughs> sin. Sin has a way of getting involved with all of us and all of our conditions so we can't look down our nose at folks. Sin ought to become personal to you. It ought to be so personal to you till you try to stay away from it. Move on. Get out of the way, sin. I'm coming through. Leave me alone. Sin. Everybody sin. Everybody. Even in your same state, you sin. Even if you listen to me now and you come to the conclusion, well, I'm saved, sanctified, and woo, filled with the precious Holy Ghost, preacher. I ain't sin. You just sin then. All of us fall short. Romans 3.23 says we all fall short. We all sin. So our job is to prepare the patient. We must show the patient. We must show the patient. We must show the patient that his or her well-being is our concern. It must be our concern. We want to make sure that this is our concern. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. The only way we can show the patient that is our concern, it doesn't matter what's going on. We'll focus in on them coming to know Jesus Christ. The patient, the, the patient does not care how much you know. The patient doesn't care how much you know. They're not, they're not so caught up in how much you can tell them and quote the Bible. Matter of fact, I told you last lesson, don't be caught up in catchy and preachy phrases. Don't get stuck with your little titles in the church. Don't get caught up on whether or not you sit on the first row, the back row, in the middle. Don't get caught up with how many times you show up at church, how early you are. And certainly don't get caught up with how late you are. <laughs> show the patient that you're concerned about his or her well-being. You're concerned about them. I listen to all these commercials all the time, right? And they're saying, we are here for you. No, they're not. They're there for the money. Lawyers say, we are here to represent you so you can be your very best. One of the best ones is Jim Adler. Riding on top of 18 Willa. If you get hit by 18 Willa, call my hammer. Jim Adler. The tough lawyer. Guess what? It costs tough money. And everybody ought to have a good lawyer, right? We ought to have good lawyers. There are some things that you ought to have that's good. These are some things you may want to take these down. Maybe on test. These are some things that you need to have. You need to have a good church home. You need to have a good church home. Every person needs a church home. 
During COVID, so many churches buried people that did not have church homes. So many preachers preached sermons, even at the graveyard, because people were not actively involved in a church home. First thing you need is a good church home. You need, first thing you need is Jesus. First thing you need is Jesus. First thing you need is Jesus. The next thing you need is a good church home. Next thing you need is a good pastor. You, you need, every person needs Jesus. Every person needs a church home. Every person needs a good pastor. I mean a pastor that you can talk to. A pastor that can feel your emotions. A pastor that can walk you through while you're going through the valley and the shadow of death. You need Jesus, and you need Jesus with some skin on it. You need a good pastor. Am I a good pastor? Do I really want to know the answer? Well, preacher, since you asked, let me tell you. I, I, I've been waiting to tell you this. <laughs> you just don't know, Reverend. I've been waiting to tell you this. Man, I'm so glad you asked me. So everybody needs Jesus, everybody needs a good church, everybody needs a great, good pastor, everybody needs a good doctor. Everybody needs a good doctor. You need a good doctor. You need a doctor that you can set an appointment with and see him. Amen. There are some doctors in Houston that are so good and their name is so big, they take an appointment for two years from now. When, when they see you, it'll be ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and earth to earth. You need a good doctor that you can actually see. A good doctor who can actually see you. I hadn't seen Dr. Williams in 30 years. But when he, he walked in the room, he was like, he was like, when I saw this folder, I said it had to be you. But when I opened the door, I saw your pee head, I knew it was you. Even with a mask on. But that's what Dr. Williams said. Has not seen me and I had not seen him in 30 years. You need a good doctor who knows your case. Who knows your health. And then he started rounding off stuff he knew about me 30 years ago. I knew we had this. I knew you had this. and I knew we had this. And I knew we had, had this surgery for this surgery. And I mean like 30 years later. You need a good doctor. And you need a good lawyer. You need a good lawyer. You need somebody to defend you. You need a good lawyer. The saints back home would say it like this. He's a doctor that never lost a patient. And they would say, Jesus is a lawyer that never lost the case. And they would tell you in a heartbeat, oh, go ahead, Mr. Charlie, and take me to court. I'm showing up with my Lord. His name is Jesus. So you need a good lawyer. You need a good doctor. You need a good church. You need a good pastor. You need, a, you need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. <laughs> Muhammad needed Jesus. Confucius needed Jesus. Aristotle needed Jesus. <laughs> Everybody needs Jesus. Show the patient that he or she, his well-being is what you're concerned with. Your patient do, does not care about how much you know. Your patient thinks it is important or how much you care. But it's important that he or she knows how much you care. Forget your degrees. Forget about how long you've been in church. One of the worst things you can say to a young person right now, I've been in church 40 years. That used to work. It doesn't work anymore. Because now when you when young folks hear you say, I've been in church 40 years, they say, ooh, let me get away from him. Because, you know, church in person is not their thing. In person church, that's not their thing, you know. 
And they will argue with you about, I can worship the Lord anywhere. And that's, that's true. But you got to do something with Hebrew chapter 20, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. You, got, you can't tear it out the Bible. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, don't forsake yourself for coming together. Because the day is approaching. What is that? The day is approaching. What day? The day when Jesus cracked the sky. That day is rapidly approaching. They get ready to lock a man up. You know the day is rapidly approaching. Y'all get that later. I mean, after years and years and years and years, and they finally got a fingerprint. Lord, have mercy. The day Jesus is getting ready to come back. So, so they need to know how much you really care. Anesthesia. Walk after the spirit. Talking about the soul now. Walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Be sure to yield to the control of the Holy Spirit. Be sure the word is in your heart and in your life. Because see, when you're winning souls, people want to know how much you care. And you can only exemplify that care by having the Holy Spirit lead you. We can't. We can't lead ourselves and show people. Because you know what? There are some folk that we'll write off. Matter of fact, now we have been desensitized to criminals getting killed. I mean, been desensitized. Oh, just, just another one of them getting killed. We have been desensitized to sirens. There used to be a time when we would hear a siren. It was a big deal. As long as the fire truck and the ambulance and the police doesn't stop at our house, it's just another siren. But God is concerned about every soul, and therefore we must be sure that the word is in our heart. Because if it's in our heart, then we can deliver it to others' hearts. And we must make sure that our lives are governed by it because folk are watching us. People are watching us every single day. People that you don't think see you see you. People that you don't even, you, you haven't even heard about see you. One of the worst times of my life is when I go into a crowd of people and somebody walks up and says, hey, Pastor Davis. I'm like, hey, sister, how you doing? Hey, brother, good to see you. And then I look at the person next to me and I say, man, who was that? <laughs> now you've done it too. You've done it too. But the fact is, people see you when you don't see them. And they just wait on opportunity to let you know they see you. Life support. Hide the word in your heart that you will not sin against God. Psalm 119.11. Hide this word in your heart. Why, why are we reading the word every day? Why are we listening to the word every day? Why are we coming to Bible study? Why are we coming to Sunday school? Why are we sitting through preaching? Why are we listening to it on the radio? Why are we listening to it on the internet? Because if we hide the word of God in our heart, we will not sin against him. We got to hide this word. Put this word in our heart. We got we to gotta be saturated with God's word. Saturation is a, a term that's used in electronics to talk about saturating the, the equipment and saturating the transistor when, when it peaks out. We ought to be peaked out with the word. Now I think since y'all listening, you all are peaked out. And especially now we're doing a five-day Bible listening. You peaked out, aren't you? How many people peaked out? No? Okay, we'll do a three-day learning next time. Three-day listening next time. The shorter you cut it, the more chapters you have to get. So if you're not peaked out now, I see when we peek you out next time. So we have to hide the word of God in our heart. Be supportive. Remember, you were once lost in sin and Jesus took you in. You were in sin. Jesus took you in. Let the patient know that you understand where he is. Tell him how God delivered you. This is a personalized part. God delivered me. 
Don't wait till Sunday morning and, and or during the week and call the preacher and say, hey, I want to do a testimony. out. No, testify to those who need saving. Because I told you before, fish don't come up the driveway. And then if I invited you to my house, I got this little fish boat, right? I got these fish and there's it's some in there, it's 12 in there, and they already caught. Why would you think that you celebrating among each other and talking about the kingdom and, and blessing the Lord, these things we ought to do, but the fish are out there and they're not coming in here. We got to go get them. We have to make sure that we understand that God has delivered us from something. God has delivered, and some of us, don't raise your hand, don't look to the side, but some of us, God is still delivering us. Amen, go right there. Bedside matters. Be optimistic. Regardless of the circumstances, believe in the word. Always glorify Jehovah God as the only true living God, the source of hope, joy, and the source of love. Jehovah's Witness asked me, tell you, tell you, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I said, I am too. I'm a witness for Jehovah God. I am a witness. Don't be intimidated by them because, you know, if they are Jehovah's Witness, I'm a Jehovah's Witness too. He's the only living true God. He's God all by himself. Don't be intimidated. But because we do not, do not have the word hidden in our heart, we are intimidated. Always. Always, regardless of the circumstances, be optimistic. Can you be optimistic about something? There are some people that, that are pessimistic about everything. I mean everything. If you want a down day, just call them. If you want to know when the world is coming to end, they'll tell you every time today in about five minutes. There are so many whiners out here that every time you look up, they, they the, the sky, who was that? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. Come on, you know your nursery rhyme, right? Chicken little. Chicken little said, oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. <laughs> I think it was uh, Pastor Jasper Williams singing that preached the sermon, what the little chicken saw. And the chicken broke out the egg and he looked out there in the world and he ran back in. Pastor Jasper Williams said, Woo, Lord, the chicken saw this world for what it was and went back into the egg. Mm -hmm. You gotta be optimistic, not pessimistic. Finally, final signs. Mm -hmm. Be a good American. Be a good Samaritan. Be a good Texan. Be a good Louisianian. Be a good Samaritan. What did the Samaritan do? He gave his stuff up for somebody he didn't even know. Be a good Samaritan. Be a good American. Be a good brother. Be a good sister. Never refuse an opportunity to help anyone in need of healing from sin. Be prepared. Walk and ask God. God, show them to me. God, bless me to be ready. God, I'm equipped. I, God, I know you are able to do it. Show it to me because I'm ready. After tonight, I want y'all to pray that prayer. Lord, bring somebody to me that I can share Jesus Christ with. Lord, bless me to know you so well until I'm always ready. People can't confuse you when you're ready. People can't, can't, can't attack you when you're ready. Always be ready. Peter says it like this. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you at any time. Be ready. Be ready. In the restaurant, be ready. Matter of fact, you ought to engage in the restaurant. You ought to engage in the hotel. You, you ought to engage in, in your job. You ought to engage. When God opens the door, you be ready. Be ready. Do not be so heavenly minded. Do not be pious that you are no earthly good. What does that mean? We've heard that over and over again. What does that mean? Don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. What does that mean? 
Anybody. What does that mean? Does it mean anything to you? Don't be so, are you all so heavenly minded that you know earthly good and you don't want to tell us what it is? What does that mean? Don't be so heavenly minded you know earthly good. Don't be so uh, holy and self-righteous that you're unapproachable and that you place yourself above other people. Amen. Why do you think on days that I can make it, I go to the front door and hug every person that comes through the door? I want to be on their level. Mm -hmm. Why do you think I get down on one knee or both knees when a young person walks up to me? I want to be on their level. And every person is important to God. And because every person is important to God, every person is important to us. We want to be on their level. You know what it means to a little boy or a little girl to look back years from now and say, my pastor got on my knee, his knees for me. They can't even interpret it right now. There was once a young man that was, that was on drugs and uh, he was hiding it. And I went by his house, and after I got through doing what I couldn't do at church to him, uh, then he grew up, and now he lives out of state, and he called me one day, and he said, man, thank you. He said, thank you for the way you treated me. Thank you for making me a man. Thank you for getting down in the dirt with me. He said, thank you. Brother Miles, brother, like he was saying thank you, and I was just... I, my eyes just start raining for some reason. And this is years later. I mean, my eyes just start raining. I mean, my eyes just start perspiring. My, my eyes just start running. And he wasn't even in my face. He's on the phone. But you never know what you mean to somebody when you take just one minute out of your, as we would say, your busy schedule. Just one minute. And then when I'm at the door, maybe some of you haven't noticed it, but some of the children try to escape me. I say, hey, come on back here and give me a hug. Because you want to be somebody who people can rely on to encourage them. Give them what you would like to have. Acknowledgement. Jesus of Christ was and is the perfect sacrifice for man's sin. Who is? Jesus of Christ is the perfect sacrifice for our sins. He was and he is the perfect Lamb of God, without blemish and without sin. What can wash our sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When you share your conversation experience, your conversion experience, rather, when you share your conversion experience, you should focus on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that alone. It's good to talk about stuff, but you have to get to a point where you can turn your conversation toward Jesus. You got to turn it toward Jesus. Regardless of talking, about, you know, we go out and we go out to play foosball. We go out to, to, uh, to play basketball or volleyball. We go out to just watch sports. Sooner or later, you got to be able to turn that conversation toward Jesus. Your ultimate goal is get them to recognize the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. It is the salvation story, the story of Jesus Christ that converts, convicts, convinces, and controls man's sinful nature. It is the story of Jesus Christ that convicts one. It is the story of Jesus Christ that calls men to turn away from their sin. It is the story of Jesus Christ that called men to repent. The word repent means to turn away from, to walk away from, to be delivered. It is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 declares to us, Once a man is in Christ, he's a brand new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, things become new. Now, let me say this to you. When those things are becoming new, guess what? They are becoming new. That's what gives people the ability to say, I'm not there yet. Well, you ought to be getting there. <laughs> you ought to be trying to get there. You ought not be saying, well, you know I am who I am. You got to accept me for who I am. No. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5 says that Jesus died, Jesus buried, Jesus rose, and Jesus was seen just for you. And had it been no one else on planet Earth but you, he would have died for you. Although you may have a miraculous conversion in a profound testimony, neither can compare to Jesus' story. Always tell Jesus' story. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Just talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Wherever you go, talk about Jesus. Wherever you go, talk about Jesus. I don't know if I told you this story, but if I tell you, uh, if you've heard it before, act like you never heard it. I was at home one night by myself. This was 1996. I was by myself in the house by myself, and there was a knock at the door. I opened the door. It was Dave at the police office. He said, I got a call from, a, from this, this number saying there was a disturbance. No, nobody's disturbing me. I'm good. So he said, well, do you mind if I take a, take a look around? No, sir. Come on in. He came in. He took a look around. He didn't say anything that I was disturbing anybody. Nobody was disturbing me. I'm by myself. I'm good. So David comes in. <clears throat> he sees my Bible laying on the countertop. He said, hey, are you a believer? I said, yes, I am. So we stood there and started talking about God. His radio started going off. He turned his radio down. Hold his office. Turned the radio down. About an hour later, there was another knock at the door. I walked to the door. I said, David, it's another police officer. Man, this is the spot tonight. So, so Raul is standing outside. He says that, he says, well, well, you know, uh, they tried to get in touch with you through dispatch and, and you didn't answer. So I came over here for backup and see what was going on. He said, oh, we just got in here and started talking about the Lord. And, and when we got started talking about the Lord, I turned my radio down. And then we asked Raul the question, have you ever met Jesus Christ? Have you invited him into your life as your personal savior? Right there in my living room, David and I caught Raul by the hand and we led him to Christ. One police officer that was saved and another one that was unsaved. When they both walked out the door, they were both born again. Hallelujah to the Lord. There may be somebody listening to me tonight that have never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. This is your opportunity to get to know Jesus. He died for your sins. He was buried in a barber tomb. And he rose from the dead. And you can invite him into your life tonight. Just trust the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. He was laid in a barber tomb. And he rose from the dead. You can invite him into your life. Bow your head with me and invite Jesus into your life tonight. <clears throat> Just repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. We believe that if you receive Jesus tonight, you're now born again. And you're going to heaven when you leave here. And we praise God for you. Father God, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share. We thank you for everybody who's listening. We thank you for everybody who attended. We ask you, Father God, to convict. We ask you to convince. We ask you, Lord, to convert. And Lord, we ask you to control their sinful lives. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you for the New Beginning Church. We thank you for all that you've done and what you are doing. We bless your name for who you are. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you for coming. If you want to give to the New Beginning Church, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. That's lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. 
77459. That's PO Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. For those of you who um, are not aware, this is the book that is coming out for sharing the gospel. We're looking forward to it being out this year. Uh, if you want to pre-order, you can do so. Call me or inbox me or text me and let me know that you want a copy of the Sharing the Gospel book. If I order it for you, you can save some money. Thank you so much for being with us. Let us stand to be dismissed. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion, until we meet again, let us say, Amen. You can come and, and give your offering now. Our mission and vision statement? We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you. You are dismissed.